third um, UDL IRN Hangout, and we're very excited uh, about today's topic. It is um, UDL Design Lab. Uh, is a place to think and share and create, and so we're excited to get started um, with today's broadcast. I'll introduce myself just briefly. My name is Sue Harden, and I am on the UDL IRN Board of Directors and the Chairman of the Professional Development Committee. Um, I've got quite a few folks with me this evening, and I'm going to give them a chance to introduce themselves, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to mute my microphone, and I'll pass it off next uh, to Brian Dean to introduce himself. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Brian Dean. Um, I'm also on the uh, board, uh, the a member of the UDL IRN, and, um, and I am a uh, special ed uh, professional learning consultant and instructional designer out of. Uh, Oakland Schools uh, in Michigan. And then I'll pass it to uh, Whitney. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Whitney Tyner, and I'm a teacher in Farmington Public Schools in Michigan. And um, Brian um, introduced me uh, to UDL about a year, year and a half ago, and I'm really excited to be here for my first UDL IRN hangout. And why don't I go ahead and pass it to uh, Melissa. Hello. Uh, my name is Melissa Krieger. I am an English teacher. I'm a high school English teacher, also in Michigan, from Novi specifically. Uh, this is also my first UDL IRN hangout, and I am also very excited to be here. Um, I'm here with two of my coworkers, um, one of whom is Megan Taylor. So, if Megan, if you'd like to say hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Megan Taylor. Uh, I work at Novi High School. I'm a special education teacher um, and came to UDL through a co teaching experience with Angelina Krieger, and I'm going to hand it off to her. Hi everyone, I'm Angelina Krieger from Novi, Michigan. I work at Novi High School. I'm a secondary social studies teacher and I'm excited to be here with the IRN this evening. Oh. Brian, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, I'm sorry. My name is Brian Wojcik, and I am um, uh, part of the board of directors at the UN uh, at the UDL IRN, and I am the Twitterer tonight. Thank you, Brian and Luis. We'll we'll give it over to you next. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is Luis Perez uh, coming to you from St. Petersburg, Florida, where I'm based. Uh, I'm an inclusive learning and accessibility consultant, and I'm also affiliated with the ISTE uh, Inclusive Learning Network. I'm the uh, professional learning chair for that Inclusive Learning Network, and I'm, I'm really excited. This is my first time with the UDL IRN on one of these Hangouts, so I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks. Thanks, Luis. We are looking forward to uh, having you on here as well. So, Brian, if you wouldn't mind um, bringing up the um, PowerPoint session right now. So we're going to go ahead and get started with a formal introduction um, to the UDL IRN Network and Learn series. Uh, for those of you who'd like to join us, um, you, you can use the Twitter hashtag, and we'll go ahead and take that next slide, please, Brian. <clears throat> Okay, so I'll, first I'll start with an introduction to the setup of tonight's broadcast. So we're using a 20-20-20 approach, and that is we're going to um, start with the first 20 minutes of our broadcast, um, actually about 15 minutes now since we took some time to introduce ourselves, to discuss what's the problem behind um, tonight's broadcast. What is it we're trying to solve? Um, Brian, uh, Dean will share his input on that, uh, and then we'll take the next 20 minutes and we'll talk um, about the, some potential solutions. So what are some uh, strategies that the team is using to address the problem that 
they outlined in the first quarter or the first third of the session. Uh, in between, we'll take some questions both from the folks on that live hangout and also from the Twitter feed. And I'll go. I'll give that Twitter hashtag in just a moment, uh, and then we'll go into the final 20 minutes, and that will be a lot of cross question and answer. So we're uh, relying on our audience to um, join in and ask questions, uh, comment back and forth. It really, this session will be as strong as all of us collectively are uh, as we're putting our whole minds into this thinking about this problem tonight. So that's a little bit about how the Hangout will work. Um, the next slide will give those, uh, it is about questions and answers and sharing, and we're going to do a lot of that via our Twitter hang out and the hashtag for that is hashtag UDL IRN so please we'll be posting questions and having uh, asking those of us those of you who are watching the broadcast on YouTube to share and respond uh, and give your opinions as well and with that I think I will give it back to Brian Sorry, I had to uh, unmute. I had forgotten that I was muted. So let me go back to uh, the screen sharing, and then we'll uh, we'll dive right in. Uh, so tonight is about uh, talking about Design Lab and 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 what that is and how it incorporates design thinking. And um, so I wanted to lay out. Um, do you, I'm sorry, Sue. Did you want me to, or do you want to talk about uh, the summit, or do you want to wait and come back to that? Okay. Well, uh, so uh, we'll come back to it, but uh, keep this in your minds. March 16th and 17th, um, the UDL IRN Summit, uh, Networking, Implementing, Research, and Scaling. Um, it is a fantastic opportunity. Um, it is out at Townsend University, University in Maryland, and it is a global experience. So uh, go to udlirn.org uh, and check it out. Register, bring friends, uh, swarm the registration. So with that, uh, we're going to dive right into the problem identification um, and, and what, it, what it meant, um, the kind of where the idea for Design Lab uh, started to originate. <clears throat> so the first big problem or the first big hurdle or barrier that I saw was that the UDL framework is, is really this theory base, this very deep theory base, and then there's this definite need for what are the tools and tips that I can use today. Um, so uh, participants needed a deep understanding of UDL theory. And the reason I felt that during a professional learning, the participants needed to get this deep theory is because you have to sit with the theory for a little while before you can start making changes. And then on top of that, if you don't know where the theory sits, when you start making instructional moves and, sh and, and doing naturally what, com what comes with impro improvisation and having to adapt things on the fly, if you don't have a strong base in the theory, you may be undermining that theory. Um, and, and that goes for any of the theoretical bases that we have. But participants come to professional learning um, for tools that they need tomorrow so that they can put it into place. Um, so, and, and there are, are tons of those to go through. Um, so, uh, like I had said, if you focus on theory, uh, part participants can become overwhelmed. So if you spend a whole day in the theory, you know, partic participants become overwhelmed. But if you focus on depth, uh, partic participants can't implement that uh, with, uh, uh, with fidelity. Um, so then how do you, you put them both in one day? And, and I'll come back to that idea of why it was one day. And then there's this concept of time and initiative overload. Educators. Uh, Educators, on average, uh, at least here in Michigan, and from what I had observed, receive approximately four to five days where they're released to go and, and look at PL. Um, so that means that one day equals this huge amount of 20 to 25 percent of their total learning for the year. That's that's a huge amount, but when that sits against this idea of being one day, <clears throat> how can I get them all of this deep theory? Let them sit with it and let them work with it. 
Um, and then there's this concept of educators being on initiative overload and instructional crisis. And when educators are in instructional crisis and need the tools right now, but they're on initiative overload because they have to look at, we now have to look at our formative assessment, how are we bringing in growth mindset, what is gradual release, how are we bringing those things in, how am I closing the gap, how am I implementing my MTSS, how am I you know, working with accessibility. When I'm looking at all of those things, there is this strong pressure that I need to get results right now, which, you know, talks about this, this again, this cultural force of time and how um, there isn't much of it and we can't change that. Um, so when, when teachers are in instructional crisis, <clears throat> it's very hard for them to triage students who are uh, there then in learning crisis. And then there's this concept of competing with other initiatives and PL series. Just in, in, in my um, ISD, which oversees 28, or my intermediate school district, which oversees 28 local school districts, here are just some of the big, big PLs that we have. There's a math literacy that's five-day series. There's a literacy interventions for struggling learners, a three-day series. There's a culturally responsive teaching, which deals with social emotional learning and the culture of schools. It's a four-day series. Social justice training, that's a four-day series. Formative assessment series, it's a three-day series. In my small unit, <clears throat> of which there are several other units within the organization, we offer 144 different professional learning initiatives in one time. So while UDL can address all of these issues, it's hard to do so in a one day or multiple day workshop and compete with them, right? So we know that, that districts, when they set up their, um, their progress, right, or their, their school improvement plan, their SIP, the big ones are always going to be, what are we doing for ELA? What are we doing for math? What are we doing for engagement, right? And then what are we doing, um, <clears throat> what are we doing for school culture? And so there's so many options out there. Um, and UDL is one of those that starts to get lost within that. <clears throat> so I'm sorry, I'm trying to move forward here. There we go. I also felt this, this strong need to, let me go back one, to really work on sound professional learning design. Um, you know, Joyce and Chow has put out a great study, uh, it, it, and in it, I won't go into the full study. You can look that up online, and we can, um, I can send you that through Twitter or whatever. But there's this 95% efficacy rate for coaching, um, and that's this leads to this idea of job embedded professional learning. Then there are these professional learning standards that the Learning Forward Group has put forth that are around, amongst other things, but really the ones that I was looking at were around culture and around resources and around leadership and design um, and moving and moving those things forward. Uh, I also wanted to bring in John Hattie's meta-analysis of PL and what its impact is. And then I had this strong desire to return educators back to instructional design when we were looking at, we were looking at learning trajectories, where those are going, um, so that we could understand why things like growth mindset are important and really truly understand what that is, why um, gradual release of responsibility or Merrill's first principles of learning were important, um, what was the uh, diffusion of innovation gap, what was my ladder of inference, all of these kind of conceptual terms, what they really meant when we were talking instructional design and scoping and learning targets and learning trajectories, more importantly, and bringing back learning science, or, uh, as opposed to this concept of just activity planning um, and single loop problem solving. Um, so, <clears throat> and then on top of all of that, you know, there's a need to create a UDL meta experience so that you, you really do understand what's going on with UDL. You're experiencing it while you're designing for it. So you can say, ah, oh, that's what a student goes through, or that's what a learner goes through, um, or that's what a participant goes through. So how do you consider all of that when you start looking at the redesign of, of professional learning? And then incorporating these progressive educational trends like you know, problem, you know, project-based learning, um, PBL or inquiry-based learning, maker spaces, Genius Hour, um, Genius Hour, if you're not familiar with it, uh, it's this concept of devoting a specific amount of time, um, usually about 20% of your class time, so one hour a week, um, to working on projects that students are really driven by and they're passion-based around. Angela Myers does a lot of work with passion-based education, and she stands pretty firmly behind Genius Hour. Um, so there, there's lots of resources to that. I wanted this unconference feel of EdCamp, um, 
but in a true sense of unconference, uh, where participants were really designing their own outcomes and how that worked. The idea of idea slams and bringing in this idea of cooperation and and cooperative and communal learning. How do we bring professional learning networks together? Um, and can you create that environment in one place? Um, and so. The idea to me was, no, I couldn't, right? Um, so I wanted to really, in essence, move from this idea of PL events to a really a PL experience. When you stepped into something, there was something larger to it. So we started to break those up. The, uh, typically, our PL events were isolated. Um, we needed to deconstruct the entire structure of PL at a conceptual level. It no longer was come and even engage in activities in one day, but it was really more how do you how do you get people to keep coming back and not have it be a series? How do you get them to start and become participants that need to be part of a movement, right? And that they needed a space um, to to develop that idea and develop their own skills and also the the sense of community. <clears throat> And so that's, um, that's when we came up, or I started coming up with the idea of design labs. Um, these, these ideas of, well, we'll get into what design labs are more in, in our second portion, but um, that was, those were the big issues that were sitting, and they were, and they were heavy issues. Um, I'm going to uh, stop sharing um, and come back so I can see the group, because <laughs> it's, uh, it's difficult to catch everybody. Um, I don't know, did anybody nod off during that, that, that piece there? No? <laughs> I, I see you, I see you, Angelina. You, you fall asleep. It's okay. Um, we only have like 27 people watching right now, so it's cool. No. <laughs> At any rate, it was this idea of how do we bring that all together and how do we really design um, something that, that it feels like um, it feels very UDL in its very essence and, I, and it honors what educators need most, which is time to sit together, be together, share resources, uh, and build, really, really build, and dive deep into and have questions. So when we were designing, I was designing, I say we in this royal sense, when I was designing this idea of what the design lab was going to look like and how we were going to build it, everything started to be very, very important from the environment to the people that, we, that were in it as experts and people that were in it as novices and people that were in it as in-betweeners and how they sat with each other and how they communicated with each other. Um, and so that's really um, uh, where, where the problem ID started coming in. Um, I don't know, uh, do we want to open it up to, do we got anything uh, at, the, at the Twitter level? Yeah, so let me just interject. I think the, um, the um, problems that you outlined, Brian, are universal. They're certainly ones that we feel and experience in, in our um, county as we're trying to deal with the best way to get support to teachers and, and to um, help them with implementation. So I think you outlined that very well. Um, we'll throw it over to Brian and see if we've got any questions coming out of the Twitter chat, Twitter world. Not as of yet. You could you couldn't make anything up, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I think you, as I said, I think that you're you were very clear, um, Brian Dean, about the the problem as you outlined it, and I think that we're all in agreement. So I'm sure there will be tons of questions as you start talking about the solutions. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's. Uh, I'll, I'll move on to that second portion. Well, I Maybe oh. we can ask Luis if he's got anything he'd like to ask, if yeah, any sure. questions that came up. Uh, not, not yet. I, I'll wait until we get to the conversation piece. So I'll let Brian continue for now. Okay, thanks. I'll pass it over to you, Brian. <laughs> thanks so much. <laughs> um, I, I actually I kind of want to check back with uh, with with my UDL army that's uh, joined us on this on this hangout and. Uh, um, Either thumbs up or or whatever um, is is that seem like those are those are some of the issues that we're experiencing in education in in, in your field is that what you're feeling? See, all right, good job, good, man. Thank you, Army, for for support on that one. <laughs> uh, let me let me jump back over to the design uh, to the uh, presentation. So from that, uh, Design Lab was born. Um, and, and I would love to t tell you that Design Lab is entirely my own, um, but, but there's lots of stuff out there about design thinking in education and what it means and what it looks like um, and really what this, what this lab mentality is. Um, 
design lab, one of the, I'm sorry, going back to, to one of the problem IDs that, that I also saw was there was no way that I could be at all of these 28 districts supporting with this, with this idea of JEPL or job embedded professional learning on the scale and on the level that, that we needed uh, to really start making UDL a, a big movement again in Oakland County. Um, so that's, uh, that was one of the other issues that I saw design lab kind of bringing everybody together. <clears throat> so here are some of the aspects of UDL Design Lab. Um, it's these three columns, and I'll go through those and talk a little bit more in depth about them. Um, Open-ended norms were, were huge, and while these norms uh, uh, have some interesting lingo behind them um, and they seem very open-ended, they were carefully crafted so that they would be open-ended and so that people would find a lot of freedom in exploring what those, what those norms meant. Um, and typically, we, we try to build norms in, in strong facilitation conversation. We, we try to build norms with the group that we're working with. But in this case, we really wanted to put them forth as established norms so that when you knew that you stepped into this place, these things are, are pretty much our expectations. Uh, so the first one is this idea of engaging in hard fun and exploration. The exploration part of that is pretty easy. Um, the design lab is centered around uh, using existing, what it, bringing some type of material with you, um, whether it be curriculum piece or an artifact piece or just an issue with a student or questions that you may have, but looking for answers within UDL. So the exploration of UDL was, was pretty, um, pretty interest, uh, you know, it was pretty stated and easy to understand. But really this concept of hard fun uh, was one that we had to explain. Um, and it, it, it's this concept of, um, you know, if you go to a great a great conference and you hear all this great stuff and you feel like your your mind has just been you know filled with a fire hose, right? It's like a fire hose into a teacup. Um, I just feel very overloaded. But you, if asked if you would do it again, you most certainly would. Any of those kind of experiences, whether they be in a conference setting or they be in some kind of physical activity or hobby that you enjoy, um, and that be then become autotelic in, in the sense that you kind of lose this, this idea of what time is and what the concept of time is, um, that's, that's this idea of hard fun. You are exhausted emotionally, but really you were, you, were, you were filled up and you had a great time doing so. So we really wanted people to ex kind of experience that and put their effort into that. Um, this concept of expecting it to be messy, because you weren't going to walk away and say, ah, UDL is so much clearer to me now. Um, it was hopefully going to be clearer, but you still probably left with a lot of questions, and that was okay. And sitting in that place of, of having questions, it was very important for the design lab, um, because that's how we build a movement, right? Keep coming back to that and reflecting, and then saying, okay, so how would I move it forward in, in my work? Um, and then and talking with it with colleagues and all sorts of things like that. Um, uh, setting your own outcomes and goals. This is the very essence of UDL in many ways. This is a type of students that we are trying to um, try to trying to encourage with UDL. And it really, you know, it's it, it's along that concept of growth mindset. But we wanted participants to be able to come in and say, I'm working on one piece of curriculum today, or I'm working on um, an entire unit of curriculum, and I'm working with my group from Novi, or I'm working with my group from Rochester, or where at whatever district, or I'm just working with seventh graders in general. But that is my goal today, or that is the outcome that I'm looking for. And having them set it, state it, um, we have a large board that we would put up that they would kind of go, go to and write what their outcomes, what they expected their outcomes to be and what kind of things they were working on. Uh, this concept of coming when you can and staying as long as you need to. Um, so are some of our design studios <clears throat> that I've set up uh, go from 10 in the morning to uh, to 7 o'clock at night, and you don't have to stay for the whole thing. It's, it, that is an incredibly long day of PL. But we wanted educators to feel like they had room to come for an hour, for two hours, for 10 hours, whatever they needed, uh, and really respecting their time. So we have had, in, in other design labs, we've had individuals come uh, for three hours in the morning, and they leave. Um, and then they come back at 6, you know, they come back at 5 at night and kind of finish up some other ideas. Um, or they come back for a particular speaker, and we'll get to that on the other section. Uh, and then the power of collective wisdom, that all the answers exist in the room, is a matter of us uh, pulling our collective together. 
then there was the, the concept of the, the physical space. It needed to be an open area. Uh, we wanted to set up tables for groups and individuals. And then we've set up this area that's really just kind of comfortable chairs that we use for consulting, people talking to each other and working through ideas and conversations. So you had this area that's very traditional, working by myself. Um, I can go and get some of the tools that I need, and I can just work. Um, or there's this, you know, how do we all get around a table and kind of talk, uh, kind of like a, a, I really took the concept from farm, um, from the old idea of farmhouses having these large tables where the whole family sat. And then this I place of consulting, which was more like a salon um, and just kind of an exchange of ideas. We wanted it to be open and inviting. Um, we created table signs that were both pre-made, so I'm high school working on ELA or I'm, you know, middle school working on math. Um, and then we wanted the ambiance to really feel like the Genius Bar. So there's a lot, the Genius Bar at a certain, um, a certain fruit uh, uh, computer uh, store. Um, <laughs> uh, so we wanted that, that ambiance, that idea of this is something cool and there's music playing and there's lots of activity and dynamicism um, uh, and the ambiance is very hip. And then we wanted a lot of technology to be accessible. But we also wanted this thing to be portable so we could move it to other places. So then we thought about the participants uh, and the environment and what that meant. So we wanted this idea, we wanted people to bring an idea, a concept, a question, an artifact, um, curriculum that they were working on, lessons they were working on. We wanted experts and novices and in-betweeners, but we wanted this concept that everyone's a practitioner somewhere in this journey. So some people that you talk to may be only, you know, a little further, um, or they may be a lot further. Um, but there's wisdom that draws from all of that. Uh, so that goes back to the idea of the power of collective wisdom. And then we created mini design sessions or mini maker sessions. So we have people working with cardboard, uh, making things out of, you know, like Google goggles or making, um, you know, show a quick tip on how to make scratch off tickets or things out of card, uh, like uh, slant boards out of cardboard. Or we have things around instructional design. What is a strong instructional design process? What is project management? Uh, what are more in-depth ideas around UDL or how does UDL hook up to something like uh, visible thinking, where do those come in, and those sessions are about 10 to 15 minutes, they're very short, and you can attend them if you want, but they happen in the same room as the rest of the design lab, so it's very kinetic energy. We wanted a lot of make and takes, and we wanted also to build some kind of re virtual resource folder that people could add their stuff to. <clears throat> Uh, and so uh, at this point, I just kind of want to go through a, a quick bunch of pictures um, of what, what the design lab starts to look like. Uh, so these were t uh, several different design labs that we kind of put together. And here are some things like uh, this is some visual thinking that was done at one, some more products that were created. Again, here's that large board saying, what are we working on? Where are you working on it? What table are you at? Um, we have lots of markers out and lots of, um, uh, like, I put a lot of toys in because I like to play with toys and silly putty, so those things are in there. Um, people get animated. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> um, I'm going to stop sharing again and, and go back. Uh, and I, I really, this is the part where I really like um, our people from, uh, our practitioners, to kind of share, share what their thoughts are on their design lab experiences or see if there's any questions from Twitter. I'll turn it back to you, Sue. There are some questions coming in from Twitter. Wonderful. Brian, why don't we start with that, and then we'll um, kind of uh, toss it back and forth between the practitioners. And if if uh, somebody else wants to answer a question that comes up, it doesn't all have to be Brian. You guys can just turn your mic on and go for it. One of the first questions that came up is, how do we help practitioners identify goals when they are unsure where to begin? Uh, so um, for me, it, it really comes, that's why we built that consulting place, right? So we sit down, we have a conversation, um, and typically I try to run a face-to-face, -face, I only run a couple face-to-face -face events around UDL a year. Um, and I try to run those right before a design lab um, so that we can get new people in, they can, they can learn uh, this, this concept, <clears throat> and then they can come to the design lab a couple days later, maybe a week later, um, and they can kind of have those conversations. But that's really where that salon comes together 
we say we have that consultation, you have experts that are roaming the room, uh, having stopping in, seeing what's going on at tables, and asking questions: Where are you going? Are you good? Can I get you anything? Can I help? Um, or do you, you know, or they send out tweets. We have we use a lot of uh, social media. Um, they say, hey, what does anybody know? Where do I start? We've gotten that so many times. And, and then we just say, what, what table are you at? And then we come over and we start that conversation of, what are you looking at? What's the thing that sticks in your mind about UDL? And they say, well, I just want to make everything accessible. And then um, we say, well, that, that's, that's good, great, fantastic. Um, but let's, let's work small first, and let's see what we can do with that. I don't know if anybody uh, from the group has another com uh, comment. Yeah, this, this is Luis here. I, I think something that's helpful is to just kind of um, engage in some brainstorming and kind of leave it a little bit open-ended at the beginning so that you're not kind of jumping right away to the solution but really looking at the problem from a variety of perspectives first. And then uh, once you do that, you can go to a second step, which is prioritizing, uh, like what's most immediate and what's most needed. And, and then kind of going through that process um, a couple of times can help you identify what are the most and important goals. So I think it's important to just kind of begin a little bit more open-ended so that you're, you know, not just jumping to the solution right away. Yeah, we, I, I tend to call that the, the Monday, Sunday list, right? So what am I going to do on Monday? What am I going to do someday? You know, someday I'm going to change all of education, but on Monday, I want to make sure that I build a strong, you know, this component of PL where, where you know, we have, we have built-in formative assessment or whatever it may be. And I think Whitney wanted to respond to that, too. Whitney, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I think that um, this is also where like pre-assessment and formative assessment comes in because um, as soon as we establish where our students are at, then I think that we, like Luis was talking about, you know, establishing some sort of a need or a needs assessment for what we need to focus on in the classroom and then take that larger piece of whatever it is that we're working on, kind of scale it down a bit and then find the small aspect that we want to begin with. Thank you. Brian, is any other questions from Twitter that we need to address now? One of the other questions uh, was, uh, there's two more questions, but one of them is, what are some things that you do to launch the lab, get it going? Uh, I market like crazy. <laughs> um, uh, I take to Twitter, I make uh, videos. Um, small trailers, I steal trailer ideas from uh, movies um, and then remake those with Design Lab. Um, the, the, the most successful marketing campaign is really relying on the fact that few people have heard of what design, what a Design Lab is. Um, so the first trailer I tend to send out is, is um, very elusive and very ambiguous, you know, like you're ready for something new or something totally different, um, and there's lots of flash and bang to it. It's the Michael Bay trailer, right? So there's lots of explosions and cool stuff. And then uh, we start talking about uh, are you looking for a place to collaborate with others? And that's really, that's that's the huge part that draws practitioners in is this, this concept I get to actually spend a day really working and building something with my teammates with my with other educators I that time is respected and that's that's one of the hallmarks that we try to hold on to um, so so it starts with a lot of viral marketing um, and then a lot of word of mouth so we're trying to build a really grassroots movement with it The final question was, how did you build the virtual resource folder? What did you use? How did you give access? Uh, so it started pretty simply um, with just a Google Drive folder. Um, and then everybody just kind of had permission, and it was open. Um, and we let, uh, indiv we let individuals kind of decide whether they wanted, it, wanted their resources to be view only so that people had to make a copy, or if they wanted it to be a living document that people would share and then change. And then we just we just started handing that out. We handed out that the uh, the share link, um, and then it started building more and more. And now now we have a system, um, a virtual platform that we put everything into, uh, that is a little more private, but but has some other really interesting features um, that we get everybody into before the design lab. Uh, and so it it really is based on just you know there's so many tools out there. We chose Google because it seemed to um, seemed to be pretty stable. 
um, I don't I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. But you know, so and if it does, then there there's some other resource resource places we can just share. Okay. Do you want to open it up to um, everybody else, Brian? You want to share some more? Where? How would you like to go? Proceed from here. Um, I, I got to be honest. I think there. I have um, one more slide, and but I do feel like I, I'm talking a lot, and I really think that um, our practitioners should really talk. Um, and so I, I will reserve the use of my last slide for after kind of we've we've talked a little bit because I want to talk about where we're going next because I'm pretty excited about that. All well. right. So would you like to select somebody, or do, do we have a brave volunteer who'd like to share? These these ladies uh, that we have here in this um, in this grouping are. Uh, part of the the PLN for UDL Army um, in in Oakland Oakland County, so uh, they are they are very strong leaders, teacher leaders. So I'm sure I don't have to select anybody. I'm sure they're raring to go, and they're just like, shut up, Brian, let me drive for a little bit. So that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> uh, if I could step in uh, for a, a moment here, poke my head in. Um, I can tell you that I went to a design lab last year for UDL uh, and Brian was leading it and um, the idea of a place and space for uh, people to work together just honestly blew my mind. It was the best day I had had all year and what Angelina and I uh, accomplished that day was worth so many after school meetings that we we would get to a point where we were um, on the brink of a great idea and then it was like we had to run home or something so that just having that block of time a long period of time seven eight hours to really just sit down and discuss not only um, what we were currently doing but what we had done and how we could make it better so that was invaluable for me I think also um, just to piggyback on that a little bit, Brian's um, you know talking about um, you know the open-ended norms and providing the collective wisdom piece and kind of getting back to the true essence of design and what it means. And um, you know, like Megan was talking about, it is so important to have other colleagues there, whether you're a novice, um, an expert, or an in-betweener, to you know really grasp the whole essence of design and take um, and work with all different levels of knowledge for you know what UDL really means. And for me, just to piggyback off both of them, um, I thought that it was such a wonderful opportunity to talk to people that were outside of my discipline and, and harvest their ideas and, and speak to them about what are some you know great practices that they're doing in their classroom and then have them coach me on how I can implement them in my room. So not only was it a fabulous opportunity for me to collaborate with my co-teacher and for us to work on lessons and, and content that we um, cover in our class but also to be able to then implement that really cross-disciplinary learning because I have the people available in the room with me at the time and I'm not trying to set up an extra meeting or, or do any of these things I have the content leaders right there with me yeah and I think not just the content leaders um, but even having the cross um, not just of your discipline, not just of your level. I was able to refine my love of sticky notes. You know, I think sometimes I get in secondary so caught up on that um, technology piece and everything has to be appropriate. And I forgot that the kids still love stickers. You know, they love to highlight. They love to use their sticky notes. They love to get up and walk across the room and put a sticky note on a poster. And we get trapped in that world sometimes and I think we forget the love of ed education. So not just cross-discipline but also cross-level and getting back to what was really fun about kindergarten and even play a game once in a while. If I could, uh, oh, go oh. ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, um, I just wanted to um, piggyback on all of those ideas. That it, um, sitting in the design lab, I felt the experience of education again myself. So it was so powerful to be able to take that experience and what I was feeling back to the classroom. It was kind of like um, uh, a a rebirth of excitement, I guess. I don't know what else you could call it, but it reminded me of what I what I love about education, um, and then I could take that back to the classroom. 
I think I think Megan, you, you probably said it better than um, than I was going to. Um, but you know, we've done design labs at at a local level, and then we've done design labs um, at a state level, and then you know we're going to do some design labs at the summit coming up. And um, it doesn't matter at what level or what familiarity people have with each other. It's this capturing this synergistic design element and just the energy of that within the room itself is is it becomes palpable it becomes tangible um, and and as Megan said it really the you know that's what changes it from a PL event to a PL experience and and people say I want to do this in my own district I want to start my own Rochester is starting you know in our area one of the local districts is starting their own um, you know and they're just they're saying well, we're just gonna we're, we're not even gonna have it be about UDL we're gonna have it be about something else and that's that's the whole idea of just grabbing that time, that energy, and saying, "How do we really come back to, you know, our, our baseline of, of what design is, and what being an educator is?" Energy is the um, one of the best ways, Brian, that I have. Um, heard anybody really talk about it yet? Because um, the energy in the room and being able to collaborate with all of these different people and all of these different ideas, it does. It absolutely energizes you and you take away what you've created that day and you you just kind of um, go with it. And the energy is long lasting, absolutely long lasting. So I had a question for you, Brian. Uh, once the design lab is over, what's sort of the, uh, the follow-up that goes on, or how do you continue the conversation after the design lab? What kinds of tools or different fora are you using for that? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question, and, it, and it, it, um, I'll highlight some more of them as we get into the last slide, but um, because of its rapid-fire nature and all these different connections that are made, uh, we try to really, really utilize a lot of social media, not only um, not only at the time of, but but afterwards, and keeping conversations going, and, and really laying into those hashtags, and then we built a collaborative group um, where everybody kind of comes together. We started it in Google Communities, and then um, or G Plus, and then we moved it out of communities. Um, <clears throat> so um, that's how we're staying together with each other. And then people are posting things. They started posting just responses to each other within uh, the, the digital folder. So it wasn't really, we had to find the way to stay in, in contact. We didn't have to try and get people to stay in contact, right? So we had to try and meet the demand of, of people saying, hey, we need to keep this conversation alive and moving. And they were just doing it. We were like, we need to find a way to capture this conversation. So that's when we started turning and using our hashtag a lot and trying to um, Turn people on to the other avenues out there, like this, like this experience, and then like UDL chat, and you know all of, all of the different places where they could kind of connect and meet up with other people. Does that, does that get at it? All right. All right. So, um, Brian, why don't you go ahead and bring us your last slide, and then we, I do think we have some questions out in the Twitter world, so we'll save those for the second 20 minutes. Um, why don't you go ahead and bring us back in and finish up the um, solution portion. All right. Uh, so this is, this is the part that I'm super excited about um, because it's the next iteration, and that's what I love about Design Lab is that it starts saying, you know, it starts kind of morphing on its own. Uh, so UDL 2.0 Design Labs are what we're rolling out this year, um, and it's this concept. We have one coming up next week, um, so uh, we'll uh, we'll see how that goes. But we want to start. I want to start really examining. We were doing them in these conference areas, and that's you know. That's great, and it's a place that I can provide because I'm at this virtual, you know, I'm at this uh, ISD level. But it's still a sterile place, right? So I really wanted something that had more synergistic energy, um, and so I really wanted to start looking at public spaces. I wanted to look at coffee shops and bookstores and food courts at malls and see if we could do them there and do smaller groupings, but still do them there. I wanted to capture that. I wanted to capture that, and and really my inspiration for that was came from um, across the nation about I don't know maybe seven years ago, maybe longer, uh, there were grade ins where teachers would go and, and take over a food court, a portion of a food court, and they'd bring all their papers with them and they would grade them. And the idea was to have the public see how teachers work so hard. 
what I found to be a problem. They, they didn't work very well. And what I found to be the problem of that is nobody wants to see anybody doing paperwork, right? So, so I really wanted to work with something else. I wanted them to see what it's like to have educators on fire burning with innovation and what that looks like. So we're going to move it to public spaces so that we can capture that. We're, bringing, we're, you know, we're adding our virtual component, which is a collaboratorium group, and we've built a special group for that uh, that incorporates chats and virtual conferencing, like a Hangout system, um, and so our resource drive and, and those sorts of things. Um, and then I'm going to live stream the event um, and using our hashtag so that people can be designing at home and they can still tweet in with, with questions or they can you know they can watch it on Periscope or through Meerkat or something like that so that um, we can capture the, the posterity of it and, and video does a great job of that but it also I really want to blur the lines between having a design lab in your own home or and still feeling like you're part of the collective um, and then uh, we want them to be small. I want them to be intimate with 10 people in these public spaces, 15 people in these public spaces. And, and these public spaces offer something else. They offer, um, if you, you know, we've worked it out. Our next one's going to be uh, at a Barnes & Noble uh, um, in, in West Bloomfield. Um, <clears throat> but they offer the food, so I no longer have to take care of the food. Um, they offer the broadband uh, and, the, and the Wi-Fi, so I no longer have to provide that. And so what that does is it frees up everybody to just kind of do them where they need to do them. Um, and they don't they won't cost anything um, especially around holiday seasons these places love to bring in people especially educators around books um, and they and you know so there's a shopping element to it and there's there's we have some giveaways that we'll do um, but uh, it's it, I think that this public space idea is really going to be the part um, and the virtual component of streaming events and blurring the lines between virtual presence and physical presence are really going to be this new exciting place for us to go with design labs uh, so uh, with that, I mean that's that's uh, kind of my take on, on where design labs are and wh where they possibly are going, and, and I think that they'll just continue to morph and continue to build on this idea of, of just becoming their own. Um, so uh, and that's really what I want to do is a uh, capacity isn't built through a person; it's built through giving power to everyone else. So um, and I'm excited for uh, for the uh, the UDL army out there to come join us um, on December 9th. Uh, so we're going to do that from 4 to 7. I'm just going to plug it real quick, okay, Sue? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Tell us again, 4 to 7. We'll put that yeah, on the Twitter. Uh, so it's 4 to 7. Uh, it's here in Michigan. If you uh, if you want to make the drive, um, please do. Um, but uh, it's out in West Bloomfield. It's on Orchard Lake uh, at the Barnes & Noble. So just type in uh, your Google uh, West Bloomfield Orchard Lake. I can provide the s'more that has the actual details um, in our in our chat notes um, <clears throat> or tweet it out again for everybody. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're going to be there from 4 to 7. Come in uh, any time during that. <clears throat> and if we stay until 8 o'clock, that's cool. Uh, but we're going to be giving away uh, Google uh, Google Cardboard. Um, we're going to be giving away and showing you how to use it and make it. Um, we're going to be giving away uh, UDL uh, PLN for UDL t-shirts. We're going to give away gift cards. Like We're just going to make it happen. It's going to be a good time. And, All right. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to have a uh, the ladies from out there in the PLN for UDL Army, they're going to stop by. Yes, right? Uh, you're on the spot. <laughs> this is a, I, I just is international. I just want you to know that. So you're just to let and you, you said, know. Right? December 9th, right? <laughs> right, December 9th, yeah. Okay. For, yeah. And All now, right, so check it out. We'll be, periscoping too. we'll be periscoping it under the hashtag PLN for UDL. So uh, you'll be able to check it out there, too. Okay. And so we do have some questions. I'm going to pass it over to um, Brian Wojcik and let him ask the last of the questions from the Twitter. I'm going to mute my mic so everybody else can get involved. There are a few uh, questions that have come in. One uh, question uh, talks about wondering how practitioners transfer the energy they felt in the design lab to the classroom beyond the design lab. Um, I'd like to speak to that. Um, I think that the energy that I got or experienced from the design lab, I was able to, after we had created something, once we were doing that actual lesson in the classroom, it reminded me of that energy and it was kind of like um, it, that moment for me, it took down the walls of the classroom and it, it just opened up the whole school because at that point I was connected right back to Angelina when we were creating that lesson. And so for me, it's kind of like the experience that the students have when they're working in groups and they create something that they're just so excited about. 
it, it breaks down wherever they are and the other person is or wherever they were and the idea of the continuum of um, just pure energy can go through walls. So it kind of was like a design lab in our school right there for me. I, I think the other piece about it that is helpful is when you're in that design lab, you have the opportunity to take a risk. I think one of the fears most educators have are um, going back to your classroom with something brand new and falling flat on your face. Here in the design lab, you get to kind of work out all those kinks and so that when you get back to your classroom, you can execute it not only with fidelity, but with that confidence and that same inspiration with which it was designed. So I think it's, it's that that trial run that getting the jitters out and then that same energy is with you and you have so much more confidence when you when you go at it in your classroom after design lab and I think that transference of energy Melissa really really brings the students into the fold as well and they become co-designers with you when you're asking them for feedback on on a new lesson or a new activity and they're able to then help and become collaborators with you that really changes the game once you've honed those skills in the design lab you then can bring your students in and that energy becomes palpable within your classroom and and the engagement goes up because the idea of collective learning also brings them in as well and they are helping to create this collective body of knowledge not only with the creation of these resources and these lessons but also you know then you can bring that information and that feedback back to you know your partners that you've made when you were at Design Lab. I also think that um, the energy that you bring um, to the classroom, you know, energy is contagious, right? Uh, and so is, you know, motivation and um, excitement. So the kids really, really take to that. They, you know, they feed off of your energy, energy like it's fuel, and um, they become innovators uh, themselves. Just for um, uh, some of the practitioners that aren't here, um, you know, I had a couple practitioners very, very excited about um, Genius Hour, right, and and how to put it into place um, after we had talked about it and really worked through it. Uh, but with, I do most of my work in secondary, so um, you know that that curriculum is a killer, right? Like hit the pacing of that curriculum is a monster. Uh, and so that becomes one of those those problems. Like, how do I give 20% of my classroom time to that when I have to get through this curriculum so I can stay at pace, right? But with Design Lab, they started instituting Design Lab within their own classes around projects at first, and then it became something where, well, we're going to have Design Lab once a month to work on skills around, uh, you know, whatever it may be for the class. One of them was an ELA class of so writing, um, and then they started to see the way that they could really give control over to their students and say what are the outcomes that you are looking for and what and where do you want to go and what is your practice and and really talking about students as practitioners is this beautiful thing that begins to happen and it is at its very essence a very UDL concept of what practitioner is right as opposed to I'm an educator and I'm a student it's how do I get better at what I do so um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over because it looks like there's another question out there. Um, yes, so we have one more question. That'll be our last one for tonight because we only have five minutes left. So we'll um, take this question and then we'll need to wrap up um, the evening. So I'll pass it over to Brian. The next question and deals with what are some examples of outcomes of design labs? So I'll start this one in, and I'll speak for Megan and I, sorry. Um, but for us, it was starting small, looking at individual lessons that we had already already you know provided for our students and seeing small little changes that we could make to offer those students more choice for the upcoming school year and then it spread like rapid fire to looking at all of our our different lessons and seeing how we can redesign and reorganize those throughout the rest of the year but really that day we were looking at one specific topic and, and we were able to create and change that one lesson Anyone else want to weigh in on that? 
Um, one of the things that I created uh, during one of the UDL design labs that um, I participated in, it doesn't seem as exciting. I actually took an entire unit that I wanted to um, uh, morph into something that has, or that was extremely, um, you know, using the UDL framework and um, where I had previously not done that. So I actually created a map and the map was really sort of unconventional and it wasn't, um, I had a couple principles of uh, digital citizenship uh, that I was working on and I was really working with um, some of the UDL principles as well and just really trying to take an entire unit and look at it at a, from the, you know, a large perspective and then I broke it down from there looking at really small pieces of each unit. Thank you, um, Whitney. That was wonderful. That that must have been a, a fun project to work on. I imagine that it must have taken the entire day to get that done, and then some. All right. Well, we're gonna wrap it up now. Yeah, entire table, uh, all set up, <laughs> drawing, drawing all over it. It was cool. It was yeah. Cool. It was did you cap? Did you save uh, pictures of that, Brian? Yeah, for sure. I tweeted yeah. about it as they were happening. <laughs> all right. Good. Uh, okay, so we do need to wrap up. Brian, if you wouldn't mind bringing up that PowerPoint one last time, and we'll just go over our final slides and make sure everybody knows um, a, about the conference coming up in March, and then we'll say our thank yous and, and call it a great night. All right, so we do want to make sure that we are saying thank you to those um, who um, shared their template and um, we want to make sure mention that the UDL chat happens every first and third Wednesday of the month so that was last night um, but it will come up in two weeks from now as well and then Brian if you could just circle back to the um, slide on um, the uh, IRN summit in March maybe a little ways back is it up? Uh, it's up on my screen, so uh, I think we're, we're, we're still seeing. Oh, there you go. Okay, super. Thank you. Um, so it is March 16th and 17th with a pre-conference starting on the 15th, and it will be at uh, Townsend, U Townsend University in Maryland. Um, it's a wonderful conference. Lots of uh, what we were talking about tonight. So there'll be four or five different design labs available for uh, people to participate in, as well as some uh, UDL talks and uh, concurrent sessions on the topic of UDL, you know, um, UDL implementation and UDL research. So um, if you haven't yet, head to um, udl-irn.org, and that's where you can click on the link on the front page to register for the conference. Uh, Luis will be there, Brian and Brian and I will be there, so um, we're welcome you to come and join us and uh, learn more about um, what is this thing called UDL and how do we get it started and how do we make sure it's working. So I'd like to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Um, thank you to our practitioners from Oakland. Thank you, um, Brian Dean, for bringing your topic to us uh, and sharing it so excellently. Thanks, Louise, for being our uh, question pro provider for the evening, and Brian Wojcik for um, sharing our Twitter feed with the uh, rest of the group and the whole larger Twitter audience. So with that, I'm going to say good night. Brian, I'm going to give you the last word because this is your baby. So. Oh, uh, let me say thank you to everybody. Um, shout out to my P, my uh, my UDL army that's out there, uh, and all those positive deviants that are out there. Um, you know who you are, and a lot of them are sitting in this in this in this uh, conversation. Um, and Design Lab is easy. There's it's not really a science. Just get out there and kind of make it grow and make it happen. And thanks to Sue and the UDL IRN for uh, letting us speak on some truth. And with that, we'll say good night. Good night, everybody.